Right. I'm, I've been in the legislature for 10 years. I right. live in Central Point, which is right next to Medford. Got an apartment in Salem because I'm in the legislature, been working hard there. But the legislature talks about things, but you need an executive who's going to lead to make things happen. And so I'm the Republican candidate for governor. It's not Republican versus Democrat. It's all about what has worked for Oregon in the past, what's not working now, and what leadership is needed to make things work better in the future. We need jobs for our workers. We need more taxpayers, not higher taxes. We need to be able to attract entrepreneurs and inventors, innovators, people that really understand that small businesses that grow hire more people. We need to be exporting products to other states and other countries instead of exporting our kids to other states because they can't get a decent job in Oregon. These are important things for Oregon. People need to be able to get a good job and stay here because this is a place not that they just want to live, but where they can afford to live. Dennis, tell me, what sort of response are you getting from Oregonians? You're traveling now. In fact, you're here in the, in the Portland metro area. What sort of response are you getting in regards to the platform you just shared with us? I'm, I'm getting an excellent response. People understand that you know John Kitzhopper is a nice guy. That's yeah. not the point. Right. The point is, do we need more management of a bureaucracy, or do we need leadership for our state where we're looking ahead 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you know, where we're looking to try and make sure that we have food growing that can, uh, that can supply the needs of Oregonians, but also be exported to other states and other nations. I mean, that takes water. That takes more land uh, that, that's currently just parched in eastern Oregon that needs to have some irrigation. Uh, we need to make sure that the urban areas understand that when rural areas are depressed, it takes money away from the schools in Portland. And so when we help provide more success for the entire state, all of the state benefits. So my campaign is about having a tide for our economy that understands the environment, our quality of life, that will lift all the parts of the state and not just you know, just a few selected areas. Okay. You know, one of the things that um, Oregonians have been asked more specifically here in the Portland metropolitan area was just recently uh, you guys had a special session and it, it was giving different kinds of whatever in regard. People just really didn't understand what that special session was all about. What was that special session all about and what was the result of it and was it good for Oregonians? Okay, yeah. A special session is supposed to be called when there's an emergency. I mean, you have, we have sessions of legislature every year now. And the reason that you normally pass your bills and, and legislation during a regular session is it allows the public time to come in and, and, uh, and testify. You can look to see not only if something sounds like a good idea, but anticipate the unintended consequences. But when you have the special session like we just had, it's planned behind closed doors. It's deals that are made among leadership. And then you come into a session without the public having adequate time to be involved, and you pass the bills that have been made behind secret doors. I mean, these are this is not a transparent and open government like Oregon is known for and should have. And so we do not need more secret, closed, special sessions. We need to get more done when we're in our regular session. Okay. Now, one of the areas, I think there were three different areas I think you guys were discussing. I mean, one of the major ones was the PERS situation, and people were really wanting to get some feedback in terms of dealing with this issue of PERS because it's bankrupting our state. Right. First, let me review what, you know, what the problem is. PERS is the Public Employee Retirement System. It's got three major um, tiers or plans. The one that costs, that's causing like more than 80% of the problem is called Tier 1. These are employees that were hired before 1996. It's a long time ago, but there are still many of the, these employees that are in Tier 1 that are still working, and plus you know, tens of thousands that are already retired. The, the challenge is that the retirement systems are supposed to be fully funded. In other words, if everything's shut down, you're supposed to have enough money to pay the, the retirement benefits for the life of the people that are vested. We're, we were 14 billion dollars short. Now, after the special session, we're about 13 billion dollars short. And so that 13 billion dollars means that it's it's like a mortgage. We have to get back up to being fully funded, and we do it over 20 years. If your investments are paying that extra money, then it's going to come from employers or employees. Now, most of the employees in in PERS in Oregon don't pay anything toward their retirement. It's all paid by the employers. So you got school districts out there, or communities, or the state, 
that have higher payments because you got to pay you got to pay off this 13 billion dollar unfunded liability and those higher payments are like a mortgage on the top of your budget so that money has to come off the top so if you've got 20 25 percent PERS payments and you're in a school district that means if you need five teachers you can only hire four because what you would have paid that fifth teacher that money is all going to go for the PERS for the other four and so when you don't have enough money and you're in a school district which is mainly wages and you know personnel costs you end up cutting teachers or and then when you cut teachers you still have the same number of kids so it means more kids in the classrooms or you cut your school year and we already have some of the, the shortest school years in the nation it's one of the reasons that Oregon's schools are like either 42nd or 46th in America I mean in the bottom 10 percent or, or the bottom 10 um, states of our country that's not acceptable we should not tolerate that every child that loses a year of good education that can't be made up I mean it's putting them on the wrong track and we need better we deserve better not promises but action every problem that Oregon faces is being successfully solved somewhere and we can learn from other states and other nations betas we don't have to sit here and say well this is the way we've always done it yes we're failing but by golly we're gonna fail with a flare mm. it's not acceptable mm. our youth are at stake we've got to make changes well tell me this um, you know we, 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 we went from one system where we had a state elected person as superintendent so to speak right the state superintendent yes. to a situation where now the governor is a sort of, sort of the superintendent and he's put his own basically his, his, his board together is that is that something that's working you think it's absolutely not working in fact what did he do he said we're gonna reform uh, education and so the Democrats and the Republicans said all right governor if you're serious about that we know that the system's not working and so we'll give you the money we'll give you the authority to do that and I voted with that you know I, he's the governor he's the CEO of right. the state exactly. so he makes the promise says it's going to happen he hires Rudy crew who flies in here he gets paid two hundred and eighty four thousand dollars a year and does nothing that's going to help solve the problems of Oregon's failing education system. What we really need is more authority for our teachers, our parents, and the principals at the local level. North Portland's problems are not the same as Prineville, right. and those are not the same as Medford's. I mean, we need to make sure that the state is a resource, that the state provides the funding that's necessary, and that and gives help to the, the local school districts and doesn't just burden them down with more regulations, more certifications, more restrictions that cause good teachers to quit teaching and keeps the, the, the bad ones. We need to pay for performance. Good teachers need to be encouraged to stay. They need to set the, the bar. And the bad ones need to be doing something else. But under our current system, they all get paid the same. It's almost impossible to get rid of a, a teacher who's, who's performing badly. There's a term in education called passing the trash, yeah, right. which means that you've got a lousy teacher and you can't put up with it anymore. You pass them to some other school district and let them have to deal with it. That's not acceptable. You know, another area from, from our perspective here in the Portland metropolitan area, CRC, the Columbia River Crossing aspect of it, boy, that has been a problem. I mean, people here just don't know where we're going. With. We spent some over $180 million bucks, if you will, just on consulting fees and this, that, there's no bridge, no nothing. And now we're hearing the fact that the federal government may be sitting on the sidelines, if you will, but the state of Oregon and Washington basically said no to the bridge. Now all of a sudden we hear the fact that the governor is saying yes to the bridge. What's that all about? Well, understand that the CRC is a project that's a, it's a career potential for some people. I mean, we've been working on this since the mid-1990s. Like you say, almost $180 million has been spent, and we have nothing to show for it. And so we finally as the legislature said this can't go on we're going to draw a line it's going to be September 30th it's going to be fish or cut bait we will pro approve the project if we have certain safeguards in place one is that Oregon doesn't go forward unless Washington is going to go in forward and that they pay 50 50 of the costs except for what comes from the federal government that it can't go forward unless you have the admiral for the Coast Guard saying that it's going to be acceptable we don't want to build a bridge that's so low that we cut off any planning for the next hundred years upstream. I mean, we don't know what's going to be built upstream. Why would we build a bridge that's so low that you can't even currently get through um, m m manufactured equipment and so forth that's manufactured upstream? 
what was their solution? We want a low bridge because we can put light rail on a low one and we'll pay 80 to 90 million dollars in payments to existing companies yes. to compensate them That's for not being able to conduct That's their business. It, it is a flawed approach to an important project. Government build, they, we build bridges. This build, part of the bridge is 100 years old, the other is you know, 50 or 60 years old. It's time to build a new bridge, but it shouldn't be driven by philosophical or political ideas. It should be built based on what are we going to have for 100 years that's acceptable both to Oregon and to, to Washington. That, and for us to go it alone now, and for the governor to say that he has the authority to do it when the legislature has already spoken, is absolutely an abuse of power. We don't need a king. We don't need a dynasty. What we need is a CEO that understands a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That's what we need, and that's, that's going to take leadership and a different viewpoint and a different attitude toward this project and the administration of the entire state government. Okay. Well, you know, again, at this same point, the frustration comes again. We don't hear this from the legislature, from the standpoint. The governor is saying he can, go, he can do anything he wants to do, right? That's right. Okay. I understand you're still spending consultant money yeah. on this bridge aspect of it. And who's representing us? Well, that is the, that is the <laughs> challenge. When one party controls everything, then you're, you're going to get, over time, an attitude that they know what's best yeah. for the people and that it's up to the people just to go along with whatever they say. That's not checks and balances. That's not the way the system was intended to work. It's not serving Oregon's best needs. I mean, do you know that Oregon's got unemployment that's higher than the rest of the state and has been since 1996? When, when Governor Kitzhaber first took over as in his first term back then, in 1995 or so, uh, we had some of the lowest unemployment in our history. And then a year later, it was higher than the national average, and it has been ever since. And so what's the solution? Raise taxes on those people that are producing. We don't need higher taxes. We need more taxpayers. We need more jobs. We need to have an, a, a bureaucracy that works for the benefit of the people. The whole idea of public servant, instead of come take a number and stand in line for an hour, We'll get to you when we get around to it. That is not the way it's supposed to function, and it won't function like that if you have leadership instead of just managing the bureaucracy, working within the limits, not rocking the boat. We need a plan for our state for 5, 10, 15, 20 years ahead so that we can make sure that we have a partnership with the federal government, that we work with them on the way we use our lands and our resources, and we do it in a way that respects our economy, that respects the environment and our quality of life. Well, you know, Dennis, I, this has been great. I really want to thank you for stopping by here in the Portland metropolitan area because, boy, I tell you, we need some answers and we need leadership. And right up front of you, what, the way I've, I've seen you up to this particular point, you, sh you tend to, to show that. And so I'd like to say uh, thank you very much for being in the area and, uh, and hopefully you will be able to respond once, once elected governor to, to the concerns that we have here in the Portland metropolitan area. Absolutely. Jobs, the education, the like. Okay. This is a nine and a half year commitment. We've right. got another year and uh, actually 13 months for the election and then eight years after that. I'm all in. I, my, my whole life has been preparing to be able to work with the legislature, work with the leaders, work with our business leaders to help put Oregon back on track. Oregon is worth saving, and together we're stronger. Well, good. Thank you very much, and thanks for stopping by. And please stop by a little bit more on the trail, will you? Uh, will do. We'll thanks again, it. Dennis. Okay, Bye. this has been Dennis. Dennis Richardson, Governor for, for Oregon, and I'm Bruce Broussard, Oregon Voters Digest. Have a good day. I'll talk to you soon.